no matter what you read about all the demonstrations, all the protests over, uh, all the names and stuff they call us, that we were kids. We were just exactly like you are. We went over and we did, we did what we thought was right. The glory of war comes a great cost. The honor of winning is not worth what is lost. All of those young lives just thrown away, all of the innocent that were made to pay. Some will never come home, their journey's done. Some with great wounds, their bodies ruined. Still others come home with no sign of harm. They've got their bodies, both legs, both arms. The scar that they carry is locked in their minds. No physical damage is there to find. The pain is there, it's still very real. All their brothers lost and the enemy they killed. We don't want to live, we paid so much. Death looks so good to find peace and such. Don't mourn for us when we leave this life. We finally found peace, we paid the price. My name is Mitchell C. Mullins. I served in the Vietnam War. Um, I was a Lance Corporal in the United States Marine Corps. I was in the first graduating class of Guilford High School. 1964 was the first graduating class. Well, I was in, in high school when I, they first started fighting, really. You, you really can't, you can't learn anything about war you know, by reading a book or um, even talking to someone. Um, the only way you can learn about it is, is actually being there. And uh, my feelings were that up until that point, this country had given me like 16 years of, you know, good life. And I felt that I owed them at least three or four years of, you know, my time. I also believed in, uh, I believed in fighting for our country, you know, defending our freedom. And so that's the, well, that's the main reason I went in. It, uh, it was something that I really believed in. Oh gosh, the first, got off the plane. We got off the plane in San Diego and it's a bunch of young teenage guys, man. We thought we were the, you know, meanest dudes in the world. We were U.S., going to be U.S. Marines. We sort of were milling around and this guy shows up and he's a Navy guy. And he tells us to get into formation or to line up and we told him, hey, we're Marines, we aren't listening to you. Well, they're in San Diego airport. We ended up on our faces doing push-ups. You know, we learned real fast that uh, you do exactly as you're told when you're told. And that's what I'm telling I mean, The second we got off the plane, we learned what boot, la boot camp was going to be like. They call you every name that they can think of, anything they can do to tear you down, and then they build you up. And they tell you from the day you come into boot camp, you're not a Marine, you are maggots. And I mean, they call you everything. And they said, when you leave boot camp, then you earn the title. That's what I wanted. I wanted, if I was going to fight, I wanted a, the best chance I could to come back home. I got my orders in, at, at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina to uh, report to staging battalion in California, Camp Pendleton. We, we took an entire battalion over. Instead of uh, individuals going, you know, by flight, we took our entire battalion over and we went by sea. It took us, uh, oh, well over a month to get to, you know, to Vietnam by I see, uh, first day, um, you see John Wayne movies and the, the war movies where that uh, landing craft, you know, the uh, gate of it goes down and the gas run out. And, well, we, we made our landing in Da Nang and we went in by the Mike boats and we're, I mean, we had this vision of we're gonna be running off here, the bullets are gonna be flying and, you know, guys are gonna be dying. Uh, the gate fell down, we come running off, and we're met by all these kids selling Coca-Colas and these women selling stuff, and there was no fight, you know. Um, so, you know, my, my first impression of the, of, of the country was, uh, I guess it was uh, confusion, because we expected 
a lot different than, than what happened. And um, after a while, you know, then you, once you get all your equipment and everything, then we started moving inland. The next morning we loaded up and took off and, you know, north and uh, we ended up right along the DMZ. And we helped establish one of the largest base camps in North Vietnam. Average day, um, when I first went to Vietnam, I was a 1341 was my MOS, um, heavy equipment mechanic and operator. Um, that changed real fast uh, to a rifleman. Uh, and my average day, would, it depended. Some days you, you would pull like 24 hour guard duty. Uh, you'd have 24 hours on, 24 hours off. Uh, that would be standing guard out on the perimeter, uh, manning the bunkers and stuff at the base. Um, and then as we advanced, an average day might have been riding shotguns on a convoy that had to leave. It might be going out into the uh, bush and standing perimeter guard uh, around uh, engineers as they worked. Uh, it, it, it changed you know, from week to week, month to month. And uh, like I said, it, it, it became a job. We almost got hit on a daily basis as far as rockets, artillery, uh, mortars. Uh, they always like to throw in a few rounds just sort of to keep you edgy. Um, most of my time was spent, leisure time is, is riding home. That was a, a big thing. Uh, your link back home um, was almost like you were sending part of yourself home. Uh, and when you received letters, it was like you were getting part of home. Uh, the rest of the time, uh, playing cards. You know, there, there wasn't a whole lot that you could do there. Uh, we didn't have movie theaters or anything like that. I mean, that's, they'd love that for all of us to get together, watch a movie, and then drop a shell in and get us all at one time. So you, 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 you really, uh, you didn't have that much really free time because like I said, every, every second you had to be ready for work, anything that hit. It's all, your combat over there is, is, is all mental. It's, they, it, they throw these rounds in just to weigh on your mind, just to, to make you, um, you think, well, that next one might have my name on it. And now, when they threw these into our base, we had a big base. Stong Ha was a very, it was the large, largest base in uh, i -Corps. And the rounds that came in may, might not hit right in my area, my company area. They might hit across the base. You know, the, they could hit down at the mess hall. Um, but still, you had to be aware that at any time, it could be in, you know, it could drop right in your lap. So, as far as actual heavy duty fighting, I was lucky. I, you know, I, I only had that one night that was really, you know, really bad. We were right on the DMZ, which the DMZ is the demilitarized zone between North Vietnam and South Vietnam. There was many times that I was at different base camps, C2, Contian, where you could look and you could, you would be looking right into the DMZ. So you were that close, you know, to, to North Vietnam. Contian is here. Two miles south of the demilitarized zone at the narrow top of South Vietnam, 12 miles inland from the South China Sea. It is a desolate hilltop collection of guns and bunkers looking north across the DMZ into North Vietnam. Its crucial importance lies in the fact that it's on a main infiltration route into the south. Con Tien is vulnerable. It is the least defensible of any of the American outposts because it's so close to North Vietnamese territory. The enemy artillery, about a hundred big guns, plus mortars and rockets, can pound Contien around the clock with devastating effect. And our ground troops cannot go into North Vietnam to knock out those guns. For the Marines at Contien, this is what it's like. We were hit by uh, two battalions. 
We had, uh, at, I was told we had like 350 Marines at the base camp. And in about four hours, well, initially they threw 300 rounds of artillery and mortar fire in. And then they hit us with uh, over 1,000 ground troops. And uh, we ended up losing uh, 50, almost 50 dead and uh, 150 wounded. And uh, they got right inside the wire. Um, and you know, into our base, they they came in with uh, Bangalore torpedoes and and uh, fire uh, flamethrowers. When they when they initially uh, hit the base, like I said, they threw in the uh, artillery and mortar barrage, and we were back in more towards the center of the base. And then we had the, the perimeter was a trench all the way around, and along this trench, every so often there was bunkers, machine gun bunkers. Well, when we started receiving fire, we had to run about 500 yards through the open with all of this stuff coming in to the trenches and uh, man the trenches. And I happened to be the first one down the trench. And like I said, there was, uh, there was none of our guys left alive down there. All the Marines had died. And the men decided to stop, and I didn't know that they did. And I kept going down the trench. Well, I, I was going through this one bunker and I saw two legs run by the gun slit, and the next thing I knew, uh, he threw in a uh, satchel charge, and it blew the bunker up. Um, I thought I was gonna die. I couldn't walk. Uh, the concussion just completely deadened my legs. Uh, I had a piece of shrapnel embedded in my eye. I had shrapnel in my arm. Um, I had to dig myself out. It's the first time I really realized that I was by myself. And I crawled back up the trench until I found you know, where they had stopped. For the first hour, I couldn't stand. So I filled magazines for the other guys or tried to help anyone else that was wounded. After about an hour, I, I regained you know, the use of my legs. I was able to stand and uh, you know, continue you know, until we were through. But, um, yeah, that was a that that was a bad night. Uh, everyone sees all these war movies and all these heroes and stuff, and and what people don't uh, they don't really see uh, is the fear. The whole time you're there, 24 hours a day, you're you're afraid. Uh, you never know from one second to the next if you're going to die. You never know from one second to the next if your buddy, you know, you could be talking to him one, you know, and five minutes later, you get the word he's gone. The kind of war that's going on around Contien inspired one young Marine to put his feelings into a poem. This one's just called Crumble Dreams. How many young men have come this way to have their dreams just vanish away? Happy young men, no trouble at all. Their lives to live, not think of that fall. They fought for freedom and to keep us safe, never to return from that terrible place, never to enjoy the pleasures of life, for they had to pay the ultimate price. Now they rest, they are at peace. What they gave to us will never cease. So let us all stand with pride for, it's for you and I, for which they died. Well, they told me, they said, you're going home. After they operated and everything, they said, you got a million dollar wound, you're going home. I was happy, I was happy. Well, after about a couple weeks, they said, oh geez, you're making a good recovery, you're going back. I was sad. But when I got back and saw my buddies, and I was happy to be back with them. I've got a picture in there. Uh, I, and that was another one of the proudest moments when you asked me a while ago. When I received my Purple Heart, my first Purple Heart, on the, I was on the hospital ship, repos, and about three or four days after I was wounded, Lieutenant General Walt, who was the commanding general of all the Marines in Vietnam, came down to the ship and presented Purple Hearts to me and the other guys that were wounded there at, uh, uh, each individually. Uh, at Contien. Over there, everything is, it's never mine, it's always ours. And, you know, that's the way we looked at it. 
every man there, every man there is, is your brother. That man's life depends on you and your, your life depends on him. So the bond that you, that you form is like a brother. And so all of them are, they're, they're, like, your, they're like your real brothers. I mean, uh, you read about these guys that won the Medal of Honor and stuff, you know, that give up their lives for their friends and stuff. This is what that man beside you will do for you. So, you know, as far as if you just try to define you know, certain men as, and for myself, as friends, I mean, they all were. They were, they were uh, um, to this day, I, I, I travel across the country to see one of them. And um, I guess that answers the question on, on, on how they were too, because they were, they, they were some of the finest people or men that you'll, I met in my entire life. The last day, that was probably one of the days that I was, I had more fear than any of the others for the simple fact that uh, I was going home and no one wants to die on that last day. Uh, we had guys that, uh, whenever a plane would land at, at, at our main base, Dong Ha, the enemy almost always wanted to throw in a few rounds, try to hit it. Well, we had some guys that were going home that got killed at the airport, you know? And so we sort of, you know, we'd, we would get over to the airport and we'd get in a bunker and we'd wait there until that plane landed. And when they opened up, you know, the back of the plane for us to get on, uh, when they called for us to load, then we'd take off at a dead run and jump on that plane and hope that they close it up fast and get off the ground. Thanksgiving Day, 1967, uh, we got into um, El Toro, California, the Marine Air Base there, and they cut us loose on leave. We headed right for the airport, and everybody is going to get them that big Thanksgiving dinner. Hamburgers, french fries, and a malt. That's what we ordered, and I mean, that doesn't sound like much, but man, that was good. You know, that's, that's what we uh, dreamed about. Um, the turkey and stuff, you know, they could have it. And we just wanted uh, our junk food. And you know, just, just being back here, I mean, well, the day you graduate from high school, you're gonna be really happy. Well, that's the way we were. We were just happy we graduated from Vietnam. <laughs> Uh, we did no more than any other uh, soldier did in any, any of the other wars, but we did no less. No, we, were, we weren't that bad guy. We were just young kids, you know, and uh, we did what we had to do, and then, then you go on with your life, hopefully, you know. People didn't understand, even though more people back here in the United States then and now supported the troops. It was that vocal minority that the newspapers and the television and they got all the publicity so no one heard about the ones, the people that really supported us and proudest day of my life up until then was the day I became a Marine. And I actually got to the point that I wouldn't wear my uniform home. You, you were treated so much differently if you were in uniform. disobedience don't do harm to any person. They protest the violence of government. These people, the more that they, they, they protested back here, that was given aid and comfort to the enemy because the enemy, they drew from that. They knew that, geez, if we can just keep going, if we can just keep fighting, eventually we're going to get them, you know, enough people back there to protest and stuff, and the government is going to have to pull, you know, the people out. Well, guess what? It's exactly what happened. Take actions to disrupt the war, actions that do no violence to human life. There was times when we would be receiving incoming, which incoming is artillery rounds, mortar rounds, or rockets. We would know exactly where they were shooting from. They wouldn't let us return fire because they said that they were near a friendly village. Well, if that village was friendly, why were they firing on us? And for six years, the bodies 
of Americans have been coming home in plastic bags. It's been a long time since we impeached the president. It's time. I honestly believe in my heart that uh, if we were allowed to fight that war and fight it the way that it should have been, we could have won that war. Is not making war on the peasants of Southeast Asia a high crime? I saw instances where demonstrators um, threw garbage and animal waste on wounded and dead, you know, soldiers that came back. They spit on you, they called you names, and they said, oh, you're killing all these innocent people. I'm sorry, but innocent people die in war. People didn't understand. My last 40 years, um, I've had some joy in it. 90% of it has not been. I have constant nightmares. I still do to this day. I don't sleep. I've been on sleep medication for at least 30 years. And I still don't sleep. Um, I think a lot all the time about killing myself. The only thing that has kept me alive is my family. It's my, 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 my wife, she pretty well saved me. And then my little girls, when she passed away, she passed away when they were 14 and 16. So I had two little girls that depended on me then. And then they've given me eight beautiful grandchildren and two great grandchildren, and they keep me going. But as far as my life, um, I don't have a lot of it. A lot of joy. I, re I to this day I remember faces. I remember faces of buddies of mine that were killed. I, there was one kid that when I was uh, medevaced out on the helicopter, I was strapped into a, a cot on the side of the plane. Well, in order to, because we didn't have enough choppers, they took out so many wounded and so many dead on the same chopper. Well, the dead they piled up in the center between us. Well, I was strapped in to where I was looking at this one kid right into his face the whole time. Well, his right eye was open, his left eye was a hole for the ground that killed him. I see him just as plain as I seen him that day. So as far as being able to adjust back to, to civilian life, you just try to do the best you can each day. You go from one day to the next. Just show you the brut brutality of war. Um, we used to take our garbage from our mess hall. When they finally built a mess hall there at the main base, we would take our scraps and put them in these big GI cans. We would load these cans on the back of a truck, and we would take them out to the dump. Well, the people in North or in South Vietnam, what we threw away was, that was food for them. I mean, that was food that they, they didn't get. They fought over it. They would. They would put four of us guys, us Marines, on the back of that truck with broomsticks. And our job was, once we left the gate, they would rush the, gate, the trucks. Our job was to push them back with those broom handles to keep them from falling under the, you know, the truck and you know, maybe getting killed. Then we would go proceed to the dump, dump it, and then it was theirs. Well, I was there one day, and a little kid, might have been eight, nine years old, found a piece of steak. Somebody had eaten a big old hunk of steak, and this kid found it. And this South Vietnamese soldier saw it and wanted it. This kid wouldn't give it to him. The guy took out a gun and killed him. Over a piece of meat, he killed this kid. And there was nothing we could do. I had another friend of mine where he was out on patrol and in all of our sea rations are the, the uh, meals that we get to eat. And they're in a box and in each box there's a thing of peanut butter and crackers or cheese and crackers, or candy bars, gum. Well, we gave all that to the kids. 
I mean, these kids, they come running around and we hand this stuff out. So they stopped one day while they were on patrol and he told me a buddy of his was uh, sitting down the road a little way, a trail from him. And this little girl came up and his buddy handed her a can of uh, peanut butter and crackers or, or candy or something. And this little girl was maybe five years old. And all of a sudden she pulls a grenade out from under her little shirt, drops the grenade and takes off running. Grenade goes off, kills the kid. This friend of mine, just out of reflexes, out of what he was taught, grabbed his rifle and fired before he knew what he was doing. Killed a little girl. He didn't mean to. In fact, he just about lost his mind over it. But things like that, things like that are, they're, 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 they're a part of war that no one ever sees. And those are the things I think that, that bother us the most, is uh, the things that we see that should never happen, should never happen. I knew, I saw a little girl one day that, she was about four or five years old, cutest little thing you ever saw. But she's out hopping around trying to play with a tree branch for a crutch and then her leg off at, at the knee. The only thing that she did wrong, the only thing in the world that she did wrong was go out and play and step on a landmine. You know, our kids and you guys, me, we can go out and run every place we want to and do whatever we want to. They, can't, they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Uh, just like at any time we could die, it's, it, it's so tragic that at any time they can die. I mean, even the little ones. And that's, that's the worst part of war. That's without a doubt, it's not how many we lost, how many they lost, it's how many of the kids, you know, that's the reason I wrote the one poem. It's not worth what's, you know, the cost is not worth what's lost. It never is. The glory of war comes a great cost. The honor of winning is not worth what is lost. All of those young lives just thrown away, all of the innocent that were made to pay. Some will never come home, their journey's done. Some will come, some with great wounds, their bodies ruined. Still others come home with no sign of harm. They've got their bodies, both legs, both arms. The scar that they carry is locked in their minds. No physical damage is there to find. The pain is there, it's still very real. All their brothers lost and the enemy they killed. We don't want to live, we paid so much. Death looks so good to find peace and such. Don't mourn for us when we leave this life. We finally found peace, we paid the price. It's, it's called you know, lost youth, and it's it, it it's a you know like what you lose by going to war, you know. The days of my youth slipped by so fast. As a child, I could see my happy past. The years went by, and I became a man. My teenage years were oh so grand. Then I left home to defend this land. I saw many things I didn't understand. Why should young men have to lose their lives and be deprived of a loving wife? No children would there be to run and play, no hugs, no kisses after they pray. Their sweet little voices never to hear, no proof at all that you were here. I will never let your memory die, for I keep you here in each tear I cry. So thank you, my brother, for giving me this, the freedom I have and all that I wish. My name is Grant Hume. This year, I had the pleasure of creating Mr. Mullen's documentary. After hearing Mr. Mullen's story and watching his interview, I quickly realized that this documentary was going to be so much more than an assignment. I realized that I had an opportunity to work for something greater than myself. I realized that I was going to learn lessons from Mr. Mullen's that I'm going to carry with me for the rest of my life. I learned there's a price to freedom. 
When Mr. Mullins was my age, his generation paid the price so mine wouldn't have to. Since hearing his story, I find it difficult to complain because I'm thinking about graduating high school, but when Mr. Mullins was my age, he was thinking about graduating Vietnam. Thank you, Mr. Mullins. Thank you for having such a profound impact on my life that a million documentaries cannot express my gratitude. Thank you for being open and willing to share your story. Thank you for paying the price.